Peter. Over to you, Joel. Okay. Get rid of that. And screen share. And why won't it go to being? That's it. Can you see that now? Is that clear? Yeah, that's absolutely fine, John. Okay. Uh, well, first, I'd better explain what my background is because it's a bit odd, really. Um, I left school with four O levels, and I'm sure looking at the faces before me, that most of us know what an O level was. Uh, some of the younger people don't, <laughs> but still, that's life. And I left them with four O levels and went to do a student apprenticeship uh, with Mullard Radio Val Company, um, which a lot of people who've heard me talk about this before have never seen a valve. Uh, Mullard's is obviously was, or if it still exists, I don't know, uh, part of the Phillips Group. Um, and at the end of the apprenticeship, I went on to their medical division dealing with X-ray equipment. Um, and uh, I did this for about five, six years, uh, four or five years, as their applications engineer dashing around the country in various hospitals. When I left school, I couldn't stand the sight of blood. I tended to faint. Uh, but when I ended up in the medical division, because that's the only division that was open to us, to the apprentices at that time, um, <clears throat> I soon learned that blood under control is, is much, um, I could cope with that. Uh, but after a couple of years, um, Philip's hierarchy wanted to put me in a management stream, um, which I could not stand because it's probably the same now, but as soon as you become a senior engineer, you stop being an engineer and end up just being an administrator and a manager. Um, so I bolted and went and read medicine um, at Arts in London um, and actually ended up as an anaesthetist um, and a correct uh, terminology for that is that the uh, anaesthetists are actually doctors um, probably certainly out of hours they're the most senior doctors uh, in uh, hospitals uh, <clears throat> because it's um, we often had to stay overnight even as consultants um, because things happen very quickly or go wrong very quickly in anaesthesia and intensive care <clears throat> however i've now retired um, and uh, in retirement, I did a PhD in to do with the maintenance of the Victorian submarine cable system. You can't get much more anorak than that, I don't think. Um, and I belong to uh, the Defence Electronics History Society. And I went to one of their meetings oh, about five, six years. Oh, it says on there 200, 2014. Um, but because it's, it was on an army base, um, we ended up with these stickers on us, on them, um, uh, but it just reassured, just to reassure everybody, um, it also says um, that I was an unescorted psycho. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> I enjoyed it and I spent my time now just dealing with the history of electronics, um, mainly uh, in the Victorian era. So what I'm going to do is <clears throat> to talk about three areas um, in uh, that era. Um, generation of radio waves, um, radio wave detection and amplification. And um, I, the research I did um, was up until and including uh, the First World War. So uh, to start on generation of, of radio waves, um, this is the traditional way in which people uh, describe uh, with the old spark transmitters, um, <clears throat> a battery um, which is keyed uh, onto an induction coil uh, provided uh, a high voltage across a spark gap. Um, and it was sort of tuned uh, using laden jars as capacitors and the tuning coil for which some, for some odd reason, was always referred to as a jigger. Things progressed fairly quickly after that when they wanted something more powerful and uh, they used an arc uh, generation instead. And I never quite understand um, 
why uh, this is all to do with negative resistance, um, which is a concept that I never have understood and I'm too old to bother now. <clears throat> but you could get um, a continuous uh, signal from uh, an arc. And it was uh, Poulsen found <clears throat> that if you had put the arc in a chamber uh, in a magnetic field and fill the, the chamber with, um, actually they used hydrogen, um, but there was no oxygen inside, I hasten to add. Um, you could run that continuously and the, you could almost get a sine wave out of it. Um, and the way it was keyed um, was by detuning it. So it was a, a continuous wave, um, <clears throat> but when you keyed it, um, you cut out a bit of the tuning uh, coil the jigger, um, so it produced a tone. Uh, you could also have modulated um, signals um, by a similar method um, with a chopper wheel rotating um, and switching uh, at, at a particular frequency, um, audio frequency, uh, which would give you a modulated uh, carrier wave. <clears throat> And so the, this one uh, in particular, you can see from the size of the man, um, was quite powerful. Um, and it was in fact um, 100 kilowatts. Um, so they managed to get some pretty powerful um, signals out of some of these things. Briefly to move on to, uh, I've spoken about transmission up until the valve era, um, but then uh, the, the, there was the Anderson Alden alternator, which a lot of people remember um, uh, because it's actually still around and still set up to run um, uh, uh, once or twice a year. Um, it's in Sweden um, and it was running at about uh, 20, less than 20 kilohertz, uh, <coughs> which was um, quite something for the time. Um, they could increase its frequency uh, by um, reflection through yep, sending the signal twice through the alternator um, and using frequency raises or triplets by, um, pick, by sorting out um, the, the higher frequencies out of the uh, mixed signal which was coming out of it. But as you can see on here, um, there were lots and lots of them. Everybody knows about the Anderson one. Um, because that's the only one that really survived. And they still run it up once a year. And this is a picture of it. Um, it I don't know whether it's Grimetown or Grimmerton um, in Switzerland. Um, and as you can see, it's got a huge antenna, um, but it still works. I like a tree in the front of it too. Uh, that's a picture of it. Um, and it, it they get it, set it going. And as I said, once or twice a year. Now, if we go on to um, early radio wave detection, there are a huge variety of uh, devices that were used before thermionics um, and semiconductors. <clears throat> there were spark gap detectors, um, which were just basically a, a, a simple coil and a spark cap. Um, Hertz started using it. I don't know why we call frequency Hertz, um, because um, Mr. Hertz, or whatever his um, first name was, um, he, did, he set up a spark gap, a tuned spark gap, one side of a room, and received the signals with a coil and a spark cap the other side of the room. But, and so he proved that there were, uh, was RF signal was crossing the room, but he said that he didn't see any future in it at all. So I don't know why we stuck with his name. Well, I do really, but still. Anyway, there are all sorts of devices used before um, <coughs> the thermionic devices. And I'm just going to, I'm going to mention a few of them and also tell you where you can see what find more information about. The most, the first one which is um, commonly used um, was the coherer. Um, but as you can see, everybody knows about Marconi and um, because 
he was an entrepreneur. But if you look, there are lots of others um, before and after who developed first various types of coherers. But because Marconi was quite uh, was good at promoting things, um, he uh, is the one that everybody knows about. And a lot of people think he's the only one who did produce one. I'll mention Henry Jackson in a moment. Here he is. Um, and the thing about Henry Jackson is he, he developed a coherer at the same time as Marconi, and they were actually good friends. But he was uh, in charge at the time of the uh, torpedo, what was called the torpedo school um, of the Navy. Um, and he actually uh, managed to make uh, signals between ships at the same time as Marconi was initially working on it. Um, but he forgave, for, uh, he gave up any interest in it. Uh, or rather, he remained interested, but he, he gave up any functional uh, work in it because he was promoted um, up to being an admiral. So how does Coherer work? Well, it's two metal conductors um, with some uh, dust in between them, too. It was uh, granulated. A number of materials were used, uh, silver and iron granules. <coughs> And the thing was that if it, if you put an RF signal across them, the granules cohered, hence the word coherer, and obviously the, the therefore the resistance um, across this device fell. And for years, this was from um, the the main receiver receiving device um, that was used. Now it has a bit of a problem in that um, here we have the, the coherer here, but once um, it has, uh, they have cohered, um, you, the only way you can go and make it receive again um, is by tapping it. Um, so hence the, the this device here. Um, and so we have the, a tuned circuit. This is the coherer whose um, resistance drops <coughs> pardon me, um, when an RF signal occurs and it, it goes through, down through a relay to uh, this device here, um, which was a paper tape and it was called a Morse recorder. But at the same time, um, this buzzer device here had to keep tapping on the tube to make it decohere. And obviously this, this had to go on continuously. Uh, this is a typical um, uh, coherer um, here with the, these are the batteries here to drive the buzzer device here and also uh, to provide um, the signal to coming which came out um, and went <coughs> to a galvanometer which is at the back here and also to the Morse recorder. Um, the, the next um, development, there's one, the one big problem um, during the First World War and earlier um, was that they managed to use um, the coherer at, as a radio um, detector um, for signaling between ships um, uh, at uh, sea. But they wanted to put it, uh, the Navy wanted to use it obviously um, for uh, controlling uh, ships in, in, the, in a war situation. But the problem was that the, um, the, the glass coherer was very delicate. Um, and when they fired the big guns on um, the uh, big ships, uh, it used to shatter the coherer. Um, so um, they had to find something more sensitive and more robust uh, than the glass coherer. And the magnetic detector was the, the um, thing that was used. Um, this was, <clears throat> as you can see, Marconi again. Everybody knows about the Marconi uh, Maggie, as they, they were always called Maggie's detectors. Um, but he was not the first person. He was just the entrepreneur who managed to convert it into something um, which was usable. Uh, but others, um, even after then, were had made attempts at uh, improving it 
but the Maggie stayed um, as being the most useful and sensitive detector and reliable detector as long as you kept it wound up. Um, the Marconi Maggie detector, which is the one that survived every, all the others, um, <clears throat> if you haven't seen one, I'll try and describe what's on here. Um, basically, there is a band here of iron, fine iron wire, which is rotated and passes through. Um, it's, it's an end, endless loop and passes through a glass tube here and then around the back. And in the, um, it, here, there are two permanent magnets um, and two coils here, one which the signal, the earth and the aerial uh, connected to um, the bigger one and the, the other one, um, a telephone with a T, T here, a pair of high uh, impedance headphones were attached. So basically um, the antenna here wound around the glass um, tube here and the other end of it's to earth. Obviously they missed out the tune, tune circuit just to, uh, so we can see what's happening. And then the one in the middle here, there's many more turns on it, it's attached to the telephone. And the two magnets um, are held, they don't like each other, these magnets, when you try to do that, I'm sure expect you to know. But in fact, there was about half a millimeter between the two or sometimes even an inch in, in a particular one. Uh, but most of them, they were much closer. And the thing worked uh, with the iron uh, wire going through here, flexible iron wire going around at about an inch, two inches per second. Um, it acted uh, as a very successful uh, detector of uh, uh, RF sine waves. I'm not going to go too deeply into it, how it works, but it's all based on the fact that there is a hysteresis, um, which uh, we all know about, and I'm sure that in the past we knew a lot more about it. But I have to keep looking up how this wretched thing worked and giving it each time I give a talk. And I can never remember, so we'll move swiftly on. The only to say it does work and it was very successful. And here you can see um, this is a a radio room on a ship on board a ship and you can see the Maggie detector here and this here is a multiple tuner um, which was made by Marconi um, with three stages and it had a wide range of frequencies that could be used uh, as tuned circuits to, to uh, tune um, the signals coming in. This was extremely successful, uh, this uh, <coughs> triple tuner here, and as well in, in combination with that. You can also see the key here. This was will be a transmitter, um, and up in these boxes up here will be the jigger coils uh, for the transmitter. Um, the, for one of the first stations, um, that was uh, on land um, was actually at the Lizard on um, down in Cornwall. Um, and this is the cliff here, it goes down here to the sea. Um, these are two secondhand plate layers huts um, from the railway, uh, which they had to put together. Um, and inside them, uh, the aerial that you can't see on there, which was just a long wire. Um, and this is a very poor uh, photograph taken at the time of um, the, how the inside of that wireless station was. Um, it was this, uh, the Lizard Wireless Station uh, was built in 1903. Um, and one of its, it had two purposes. One was uh, for communicating with ships as they came past, but the other was to see how much um, the pole do transmitter would interfere uh, with communications um, nearby. And the pole do transmitter is about five, six miles away from um, the Lizard Wireless Station. And if you go there now, you can actually uh, go in there by contacting, oh, I've forgotten his name now. Um, <coughs> it's owned by the National Trust 
um, and it's uh, the keeper of it lives in a cottage not far away. Uh, very nice chap. I can't even remember his call sign. Um, he's an ex um, uh, maritime wireless operator. I'm sure somebody will remember his name in a minute. It begins with a B. Um, and the, half of the stuff here is original and the rest of it um, has been constructed uh, by the volunteer engineers at Porthcurno um, <clears throat> Museum, which is about 10 miles down the coast. It will work, but it's uh, quite illegal to work it. Um, but you can see uh, the main components of it. And that's a copy of the original picture. And even the lighting um, in there uh, works, uh, was, is, is original stuff that they put in there. Um, there is a big fluorescent fitting across the top here. Um, the second hut actually contains a modern uh, amateur wireless station, um, which if you speak to, uh, I think David, somebody, I can't remember his surname. Uh, if you speak to him, you can actually use it, um, say that you've spoken from the, the Lizard Wireless Station. Uh, in the end, it was it moved to uh, down to Land's End. Um, this is a photograph of an original of the Moor sinker, um, which uh, was um, that bit there. But um, the one that I photographed here was actually at um, the, Pol uh, the PK um, Museum and is an original one. Um, the paper tape is contained underneath here and is driven by this key, cockwork key. Um, to through there, um, and here is a magnet, uh, electromagnet, which shifts the pen um, through here onto the paper, <coughs> um, which is all well and good as long as you to remember to, to wind it up all the time. Uh, what I forgot to say was um, that by the Maggie detector, it did only work uh, whilst the band was moving, and you had to make sure. Um, it, it, but the clockwork motor with, had a big handle at the end um, and it was um, um, a clockwork mechanism pinched out of um, a record player. <laughs> but this and this similarly, um, beautiful brasswork, um, but that is an original one and it works, still works. And this is the um, circuit um, of um, the uh, station at the Lizard later later a few years later but before it moved um, to St Just uh, which is down near Land's End and here you can see a magnetic detector here uh, the aerial signal came in here via that triple uh, multiple tuner um, <clears throat> and then it had a choice you had a choice of either using a crystal detector uh, which I'll come on to um, <clears throat> and you could switch over between uh, magnetic and crystal detectors, um, and uh, in this, and now it, it was with a, a low resistance phones. Um, so it, things progressed slowly, but and you, here you had the choice of magnetic or crystal uh, detector. <clears throat> Talking of crystal detectors, is this chap called Greenleaf Whittier Picard, uh, 1877 to 1956. And he tested 31,250 combinations of materials um, to, uh, till he could find a, two, a combination um, which produced a good um, crystal uh, <coughs> uh, to act as um, a detector. Um, he, he's a very clever guy. He, he called his, his uh, the most sensitive one Pericon, which is um, perfect Picard contactor. Um, <clears throat> he, he had patents for cat's whisker, for loop antenna to reduce interference and propagation. A really clever guy, um, but nobody seems to remember him or Jack. Uh, they remember Marconi. And here are two of the, his from his patents, two of the um, cat's whisker and uh, <clears throat> another one here, which wasn't a cat's whisker a boronite spike um, and zinc site. Um, <clears throat> but those were the sort of thing. And of course, 
really, you, what he, he was verging some of the time into the field of semiconductors without even realizing. There were some very odd detectors as well as a fine point electrolytic detector um, where you had an acid uh, with a weakish acid uh, with one conductor uh, was uh, iron and just a tiny point just touching the surface um, was a, a platinum needle. And this would complete a circuit and would actually uh, also act as a detector. But it was they weren't used that often uh, because it was so difficult to keep um, th this just pointing. You certainly couldn't use it at sea or any mo other moving vehicle. Uh, because the, water, the liquid would um, keep moving. Fessenden even developed, before valves, he even de uh, developed a heterodyne detector um, <coughs> well ahead of his time. So we, um, I'll show you later on a couple of books, uh, one of which um, details a lot more about um, the detectors. <clears throat> um, but now I'm going to go on to uh, magnifiers, um, which were virtually, which were, some of them were genuine amplifiers, and some of them were just magnifiers, um, and some of them were electromechanical, um, which enormous different uh, number of types which um, I can show you where you can find out more details about them. But I'll show you some of the more interesting uh, magnifiers or amplifiers. The problem was the signals that they were looking at were very, very weak. Um, and so some very, very sensitive galv galvanometers were made. This one was in about 1880, um, <clears throat> a mirror galvanometer. And the big problem was that they had to deal with was um, the fact that the signals they were looking at, we, we would normally amplify them and then use some fairly hefty devices um, <coughs> to uh, plot things on paper. But they didn't have those amplification um, advantages that we, that, um, we had, certainly have now. Um, that, so a device like that, um, uh, mirror galvanometer would uh, the light from here's be an oil lamp whoops uh, an oil lamp um, shining through this lens here which had a white um, had a hair line in it which was projected into the galvanometer <clears throat> the galvanometer pointed back um, to the scale which was above um, and this was okay it was very sensitive uh, or could be very sensitive, um, but some, but often you needed um, to watch extremely carefully, um, and were certainly with signals that were coming along um, submarine telegraph cables, um, which acted like great capacitors anyway. Um, it was very very difficult uh, to see how the signals were, so various types of magnification were required. Um, what uh, they, the commonest um, one would be um, like a mirror galvanometer. It would be a very, very fine mirror, small mirror and very, very fine supports to it. So it was as frictionless as possible, but it was certainly would not, you would not be able to make it draw a line on a paper tape. But there were, they had some incredible ideas about how to, to magnify things. Um, here, the, here we have one of these mirror galvanometers um, in uh, plan, if you like, um, it, with the powerful magnet. And it would be, so the mirror would be supported by two very, very fine wires. So here comes the light, um, light beam from here onto the mirror and it would then shine on these selenium um, strips here <coughs> so that 
um, a very, very fine current would move the light uh, easily amongst here, here because there was no friction. Um, and the, this was um, one way of <coughs> uh, magnifying these very small signals um, in, for example, um, telephone, in telegraph, submarine telegraph cables. Um, but the, the most interesting one, I think, is the Thompson uh, recorder, siphon recorder. He, um, Thompson, William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, uh, was deeply involved um, in submarine cable system. He was a professor of physics in Glasgow. Um, and early on in the submarine uh, game, uh, uh, cable game, um, he, invent, he used a, what he called a speaking mirror galvanometer. Um, but uh, it was like the, the galvanometer I showed just now, um, but the, the beam of light would move very slowly and very, a very little, and it would drift and all sorts of things. Um, and he, he developed that as far as it was possible to go. Um, but in that early days, um, that would mean that in a transatlantic cable, um, it, you could only get about four or five words per minute. Um, <clears throat> and it kept drifting. And you had to have one very experienced operator uh, looking at the, the tiny uh, line moving backwards and forwards on the uh, scale and another operator writing down the signals. And it was very laborious, very slow. So he thought that he wanted to do something to mechanize it, to make it, it better. Um, and so he invented this thing called the siphon recorder, uh, which uh, must be said is the, the first inkjet printer. Um, it's, but it's easier to show in the next, the next diagram, but if I point out the major bits is the paper trace coming up here. <coughs> um, and there's a little um, container of ink here, um, which I'll show you a, a diagrammatically, um, so that uh, via a siphon, which didn't actually touch the paper. Um, so there was absolutely no resistance at all. And there was a fiber coming from here uh, to the the um, si to this little siphon uh, piece of tubing, and so it would print on here. Um, I'll show you much better in a moment, but I just need to point out a couple of things. On the top here, there is a device called the my mouse motor, um, which it's called a mouse motor because if you remember those little things for exercising mice, um, they where they had to run around in a cage. Um, well, this was driven by an electric motor. And it looked like a, ma a mouse motor, so it was uh, a mouse exercise thing. So it was always known as that. And it generated a high-ish vo high voltage. Now, to show more, dram more diagrammatically, here's the mouse motor here. The, this is a fine fiber here, which is, is attached to this coil here, which is dangling uh, in this very powerful magnet here. Two weights to try and centralize it. Uh, <clears throat> the signal comes in here, up round and round this coil here with, with no friction really. Um, <coughs> and then that comes out, that goes to earth or wherever. Now this, this here is a fine thread, which is attached to the coil here, which moves with the signal. The virtually frictionless, this is the tube here, a glass tube coming down here. Um, and it is allowed to rock on this axis. Um, so again, so there's very, very little friction. The main friction problem would be here, where this touches, rubs on the paper. But what the mouse motor does um, is it generates a, a really a static electric charge down here, 
which goes into this insulated thing containing the ink. And the electrical circuit is through the tube, this little tube here, not actually touching the paper, but the ink is attracted across by the charge. And this paper, this um, panel behind the paper um, is earth <coughs> and it's being pulled along. So basically, it's virtually, virtually frictionless. Very clever and it worked amazingly. And this is the sort of signal you get. Um, signals, uh, they, they've drawn it like this uh, to show what the Morse code looks like, but they were using cable code. And cable code was um, that the elements were actually the same um, length. The dot and the dash were the same length. But a dash would be negative and a dot would be positive. Um, and so if you look very carefully, that's it were, you, the word cable is along there. But obviously, because it's now on an ink strip, uh, they could run it a bit faster and also um, they could take at their leisure to decode it um, without sort of using clerks rather than uh, really highly qualified signalers. Other people um, try to improve the uh, amount um, that they could amplify the signals. And here's another a similar device developed by Sidney Brown. Um, this is a drum which rotates along this axis here. And um, it's insulated in the middle and two contacts, uh, they're two separate uh, brass discs, and they're rotating. And <clears throat> because they're rotating, a very fine pen, um, with, no, with no ink, um, it's just a needle really, um, was also uh, made to move from side to side by the incoming signal from a, the galvanometer here virtually fiction free on there as long as the disc, uh, as long as this drum kept moving. So, I mean, it, it, incredible really how they managed to design these things. And this was extremely successful, um, especially for on, on the um, submarine cable routes. Others, um, there's the heart beam magnifier, um, 1919, moving on a bit. Um, this was basically um, a similar sort of idea, which moved the, the, these two things were hot wire, uh, were producing um, the hot air coming through here and coming through here. Um, and this, these two resistance wires uh, were connected as a bridge. And as this um, well, the signal came along here, it will move the hot wire in an or the wire um, which was heated um, electrically. It would um, the resistance of it would change um, as the wire was wiggled to and fro. Such ingenuity. Um, and this is a picture of a Hurley, Hurley magnifier. Um, this one's in the Science Museum in London. Now this guy here won a um, Nobel Prize for Medicine. Uh, <clears throat> this is Eindhoven. Um, and he invented the ECG machine with no um, electronics in it at all. Um, it was basically, um, it, these are the um, salt water in both hands and one foot. And we still use that as being my favorite triangle to, um, to this day in ECG machines. Um, and this was another extremely sensitive uh, galvanometer, um, which was in fact a quartz fiber, which had been um, uh, covered in silver plating um, in a magnetic field. Um, and as the very, very small current um, passed through it, um, the 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 uh, conducting quartz, the quartz with the conducting surface 
uh, would move in the magnetic field. And this would be a very shining uh, light, very bright light uh, through here to a moving piece of uh, film. Um, and so the tiny, uh, the, the voltage between uh, these two coming out of here was, would be a very low current and of the order of one millivolt. I'm still saying today after all. Um, but he actually produced, produced an ECG trace um, on this moving plate. I got the Nobel Prize for it. Other incredible uh, amplifiers, this is Horton's flame amplifier. Um, here we have um, uh, a, a gas flows in here and through here and up there, the flame, coal gas. Um, and the signal changes uh, because this, this is a here and here are flexible, very slightly flexible. Um, insulating uh, and, and balanced on here, through here, um, is uh, a coil on iron here. And the signal would very slightly move um, the core backwards and forwards. And this would affect the color, the flame here because the ionization would change here. Um, and so quite high frequencies, uh, audio frequencies, uh, could be amplified um, by this very simple means. Then there are a couple of uh, that I'll just finish off with, which are a little bit more uh, complicated to understand. And I still don't believe that they work, but they actually do. Um, this is Brown's telephone relay, same as G Brown as uh, and the drum relay um, and it looks like so uh, the signal coming in here goes on these coils here uh, this is permanent magnets here and this here is a very very fine flexible um, piece of uh, steel and here there's a contact with a drop of oil in it and it doesn't say that it was conducting oil, but I think there must be some conduction in it to make it work. Um, because as the um, signal came here, it would slightly move uh, this here, which changed the current coming up here. Um, and at the same time, um, it, the magnet here will be adjusted slightly depending um, upon uh, the heat um, that was going, that was being generated here, and the movement of this. Very difficult to understand how it worked, um, but it did. Um, and I, I still can't work out. I read the papers over and over again, um, and either he was hiding something in the paper, um, but it worked. Um, and it was also developed uh, to be a stethoscope, an electronic stethoscope and it would be an awful lot to cart around with you. As I said, uh, just to finish off with, I said that um, it was a very good book um, <clears throat> by VJ Phillips. I, mean, I think he must have died by now. He was um, in his eighties when I've contacted him all oh, 20 years ago now. Um, so he, he, he must have passed on by now. Um, he was at Swansea University um, and was uh, there the, on the, in the Department of Electrical Engineering. And he did his uh, PhD thesis um, on early radio wave detectors and, um, and then published it. Um, it's out of print, but it is an absolutely fantastic book, which goes through every type of radio wave detector before thermionic valves. Um, and to mention it at the same time, um, there's another book that he wrote, um, just for interest, um, is all about the history of oscillography before cathode ray tubes. Um, now, both of these books are out of print, which is a great shame. Um, however, 
No. Um, another very interesting book, if you can get hold of it, is uh, Radio Telegraphy Telephony by G. G. Blake. And I have struggled, it came out in 1928, and I've struggled to try and contact him or his, or rather his family. Um, and I just can't. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning that is because um, the first um, two books that I mentioned um, are available uh, from uh, the Telegraph Museum at Porth Kerner um, as CD-ROMs. Uh, I got permission to, to uh, copy them from the publishers um, and the family. Um, and as long as the profits were going to charity, which the museum is a charity. <clears throat> Similarly, um, there was a book by uh, Laurie um, published in 2009 on the history of Lands and Radio. And with their, his permission, um, that's also available as CD-ROM. Um, from her charity, uh, from the Telegraph Museum at a very reasonable price. Now the Blake book, um, I've done all I can to find out who, where the copyright is. Um, and uh, it's very difficult when I can't find it, but it is available if you really want one. Um, I have uh, converted it to a CD-ROM. Um, but it would have to be, avail it's available from me. We can't sell it commercially because uh, um, we can't sort out the copyright. Well, I hope that's um, left you with some interesting thoughts that you might want to go and uh, look further into these things. I think it's absolutely fascinating what these engineers managed to do. Um, they were called electricians. Um, at that time, but they were the equivalent of our chartered engineers. Um, it's fascinating how they, what they managed to do uh, to without uh, thermionics or semiconductors. Uh, I hope you found that interesting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to John. Um, we'll just go back to. If you want to stop sharing, John, we can bring our faces back up and we can... Um, if I knew how to stop sharing, I would. No. You are screen, so oh, stop share. Yes, there you go. Yeah, all right. So, first of all, a thank you very much to John. That was a... Very good, very interesting. Very good. It was a very interesting one. Indeed, and I'm... Oh, Richard's back as well. Yeah, Richard's applauding. I, I throw it open to the floor for any comments for John. Is there anybody? Someone must have something to say. <laughs>